Hello everybody, welcome to a bit of a fun experiment that I decided to try recently. Um, because you know what, I saw a comment come up several weeks ago, and it's come up a few times kind of here and there, uh, basically saying, you know, there is no possible way to do the end game or coda or whatever else without this all just crazy grind, it's the only way to do anything, and uh, you know, the, the, you, you know the deal. So, um, naturally, what I had to do was test a few things. Like, Basically, what I wanted to see is if I region locked a save file entirely to Tynemouth Hill, could it actually become endgame viable? And for that matter, uh, what do endgame skills end up looking like in this particular scenario? What are the actual benefits that somebody can exploit kind of getting up to this point? And, uh, you know, just kind of the whole journey to get here. Uh, so, yes, welcome to Rookie Hell. Um, and uh, let's kind of discuss some of the discoveries along the way. So, go ahead and uh, start here at the creation of New Guy. What a creative name. Now, we did the usual kind of uh, kind of strong start setup, as I like to call it, uh, wherein basically, whenever you end a fight, um, pretty much all your experience is going to be lumped up into one little happy ball, and it gets multiplied up depending on kind of how many units you had of any particular class in that fight, and then split up uh, based on the level difference between them. So, for example, if you have a lower level class, they will usually get the lion's share of what's there. Now, what I like to do at the very start of the game is essentially uh, the very first tutorial fight, I like to take all of the uh, armor off of everybody, take the weapons off of most of everybody, then give them uh, weapons that don't match their weapon skills because you can't affect their skills, but you can't take away their gear. Good question as to why, but anyway, um, yeah, apparently uh, Mr. Lands doesn't mind if you take his uh, fancy cheat sword, and uh, yeah, so uh, basically what you do is you leave a couple characters that can actually clean up, um, especially if you give, for example, Vice a, uh, a short bow, that's usually what I end up going with, um, you can create a situation where you end up mopping up most of that initial fight, uh, you can go and friendly fire your own units to make sure that all of the experience goes to the uh, warriors. Now, if you have both Vice and Denim survive, you'll end up uh, having both of, uh, you'll end up having warriors at about five. If uh, it's only Denim that makes it, uh, it'll be at four because you lose up you lose a little bit of that extra unit scaling. Honestly, it doesn't matter that much, especially for this. Um, mostly the reason that I was practicing this particular approach was for the uh, uh, for the one run of uh, basically doing the entire game Iron Man solo with no shops or anything. Boy, that run has been a years-long grind at this point. Anyway, moving on. Um, so, uh, essentially what we do... For that first fight, the reason that we're trying to get any levels whatsoever is because as soon as you get levels on Mr. New Guy here... Um, any levels that you get, uh, the second tutorial fight is level locked, meaning that they will be at a lower level than you. Um, so if you get to four, for example, um, now level differences won't matter that much later on. Actually, past about ten or so, they start dropping off pretty drastically, but at the very early game, a level is a massive deal, and especially if you come in with a frickin' endgame weapon that has been cheated with a level 2 requirement. This is the only time you see the sword in the game, by the way. Uh, the one you get later is a different version with different stuff and stats and all that kind of business. Anyway, um, so yeah, the thing is a straight-up lie, but you can, for whatever reason, take it from lands. Who knows why? You couldn't do that in the original. Um, and before anyone cries, oh man, the remake didn't try, uh, don't even get me started. Anyway. So, what we do is we end that tutorial fight. Again, if we had both of those fights done perfectly with both the warriors leveling up, we would have gotten them to eight. Um, honestly, that doesn't matter in this context. Actually, it was better to have the warriors at a lower level uh, as possible, but I still wanted to get some better gear. For example, the, uh, I believe it's a bronze helm. It's either the bronze helm or the chain leggings. I can't remember off the top of my head right now. That you, It might actually be both. That you can't actually buy at the store up to this point. Bear in mind, again, we are at a very early game store. It is, it's the first store, the first version of the store. Um, there's almost nothing in that thing. So, uh, so yeah, being able to get some better uh, gear is helpful. Now, you might say, where did we get the better gear? Your initial starting people, um, they will scale up based on level. Uh, this is the case for the majority of NPCs that you hire throughout the game. And um, it just so happens that the uh, warrior unit that you get uh, will scale up their gear. For some reason, their weapon doesn't scale. Their armor does. Uh, their shield is counted as a weapon, whatever. 
uh, this actually becomes especially weird if you ever lose Canopus and then you come back and you have, like, let's say Vartan, like, let's say Canopus dies over the course of your playthrough and you go back to get a second one. And so you had your Vartans at, like, friggin' level 30 or whatever, and then you go go and pick him up, and he's he's there with his uh, full uh, worm scale set, but he's got a short bow on <laughs> So, it, it's weird stuff like that that you see sometimes. Most of them aren't level locked, but a few of those early game NPCs that they expected you to go back and potentially cheese, they are, they do have their uh, weapons level locked. We'll get to why in a moment. But, uh, what we do is we equip all these randos with a sticker in the main hand, a crossbow in the second hand. Reason being, we want to make uh, use of uh, range as much as possible early on. We are going to cheese the hell out of the AI. Um, but we also want to have that additional dex bonus off the sticker. It gives you an extra three dex. Um, generally speaking, when it comes to bonus stats on weapons, usually your offensive stats are going to apply when put in the main hand. Defensive ones uh, when put in the uh, uh, offhand. There are exceptions, like for example, if somebody's blocking with uh, their offhand weapon or deflecting with their offhand weapon, or you know that kind of business. But generally speaking, that's how it that's how it ends up going. There's a lot of you know under this specific circumstance, this happens kind of situation. So I'll try not to get into that this time. Anyway, so the reason for this, and you might be thinking, why crossbows? Why not bows? I heard the bows are too good. They're just too good for this world, and not really. They scale well, they're all right, they got good range. Okay, fine, whatever, that's boring. But they're overplayed. They're, like, their whole overpoweredness thing, it's more a convenience thing more than an actual overpoweredness thing. We'll get to that. Anything can get to that level. Again, try not to go down that particular rabbit hole this time. So what we do after that, after we've killed off the tutorial, we've unlocked Tynemouth Hill, we get to our random fights. Now, this is partially going to be a tutorial on how to scale the level 25 wall, the level 30 wall, whatever you want to call it. The part where the game goes from low-end scaling to high-end scaling. Uh, basically, the, there's a level. It is decided by each particular map in each particular encounter. Um, now, the way each of these maps work is they have a basically a spreadsheet of different units that they can spawn. They only have... Uh, they, they have two different versions, so just think two different columns. Low level, high level. Where that breakpoint is, is different uh, on each map. So in, like, for example, in Tynemouth Hill's case, um, it's at 23. Uh, so, for example, you level up your units past 23, it will automatically change the AI to levels 25 and 26. They will get a level advantage, they will get, but that's not the important part. The level advantage is there to clue you in that, uh, the AI is sick of your shit, <laughs> so they're gonna come in with all that good gear. So that's uh, the you know that's the point where the game starts scaling up on you. Anyway, so before uh, before we get into anything too crazy, in most maps this is actually why the AI comes with two different weapon skills because the AI doesn't have gear that is selected for those particular slots in that list. All they have are skills, and then based on the AI preference, which you don't actually see in game, it's like a little background kind of little tech box. Um, and as far as I'm aware, uh, we don't actually know the full, like, functions of each of those AIs yet. That's something for Rakes and Gibbs to work all their techno magic on. Um, but basically what it boils down to is that, uh, they will just pick out their list from a pile based on, uh, level restrictions and based off, uh, what'll be better for their particular role and for their particular weapon skills. We've covered all this before, I just want to go over this as a refresher. Now... We get into the random fights. So, our basic crossbows, uh, since we've seen a few extra levels, uh, you know, they're okay. We're stuck in a low-level bracket, that's fine, but generally speaking, around, I would say, four to seven is probably the safest of your early game levels. Um, one to three can get somewhat dangerous, because even, you basically need high skills uh, to, uh, well, to have them completely carry their own if you don't know what they're doing. If you know what you're doing, you're honestly going to be fine one way or another, but if you're just dead braining it, just so you know, you know, one to three can sometimes be an issue for some classes, which is why we're making this guide here. So, we can deal okay damage uh, when it comes to clerics. Um, I have selected for it to go to the next picture multiple times. I don't know why it has not done so. There we go. Now it's back to working again. Thanks, computer. Um... So basically all we're doing is the ant approach. We are surrounding stuff and we are poking at it until it dies. Now, we don't have herpetology yet, so our damage against lizards is garbage. Um, and on top of that, we have no bonus damage to really work with. 
Uh, we don't really have any weapon skills on anybody. So, again, just grunts doing the grunt thing. Um, I basically did this exact build on a Knight of Lotus uh, run once, uh, just exclusively throughout the entire game. It was shockingly fun because the rubber banding in that game just makes everything work. Anyway, so we do one damage in some cases. In a lot of cases, our leader does one damage. But the point of these early game fights is not to grind class levels. I want to be very clear on that. Yes, technically, on some level, that's what we're doing, but it's not what we're after. The class level itself, it's basically just going to be a gate to gear access, but every time that we go up, we potentially have the option to get more gear. Uh, we have access to new skills. We have access to uh, to new, like, you know, unlocks as far as uh, equipment goes. Um, the class level itself is not a metric of strength to any degree. It is Honestly, by uh, even by around mid-game, it becomes irrelevant in a lot of cases. It really just becomes about the gear and the skills. Um, so, as you can see, we're still not doing very much. This is going to continue until we get some skills to improve our situation. Um, we can just sort of plink away at lizards. Their vitality is much higher than people. Uh, even with Canopus upgraded to a battle axe, he's, you know, he's still just barely scratching away at them. But we get our first interesting item uh, early on into these drops. And before you say, wait a minute, why aren't you hiring people and just stealing other equipment? Don't worry, we'll we'll cover that. So we get a Kaltia. Um, so you actually have two different places that you can gain access to charm early on in the game. You can just go to the store and buy charm scrolls, or you can use the Kaltia as, as a uh, active uh, or an action use item. Uh, basically, that just means that you you know you wave the thing around and it casts uh, uh, casts charm a couple times. Pretty handy. Um, it's actually a pretty good money saver if you have somebody that's a dedicated charm user, and you can get that very early. So early on, the one that we're scared of, the level that we're scared of, is ten. We want to not reach ten for as long as possible with whatever classes we have available. So I'm using Vartan right now to kind of soak up experience and give us a few more fights so that we can hopefully get some of those little, like, pre, uh, you know, pre-10 uh, weapon upgrades, you know, your Zeistens, Battle Axes, that kind of thing. Uh, we're not, we're probably not going to end up getting any longbows, though that would be kind of ideal. But I'm thinking, you know, we're, we're just getting a few little armor upgrades. Uh, we got our first warrior ring uh, out of all this. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, why am I saying we got the first warrior ring? I'm thinking of the mind ring later. No, I, I got warrior rings for everybody. So this is the first thing that we should mention. See, part of that whole bows are overpowered argument that I personally don't like is like the, the idea that you just pick one skill and you grind, 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 and that is the, you know, that's just the thing. It's, again, like, let's take archers as an example. Terrible movement. Uh, they've got terrible defenses. If anything gets close, they just melt. Uh, their dead zone goes up to like six tiles by the end of the game. So their actual, you know, their actual use is a lot more awkward than uh, than sometimes gets mentioned. But if somebody sticks to them exclusively for long enough, then you know they're gonna have essentially maxed out skills. And any maxed out skill in the game will be busted. It doesn't matter what weapon type it is. In fact, I just saw a message a few minutes ago. Asking, hey, are controls even worth leveling up in the vanilla game? And you know what? That's exactly one of the things that we ended up doing over the course of this test here. So, and by the way, this isn't new information. Like, the, as far as cudgels go, honestly, the Damask Mace is my favorite weapon in this game. <laughs> but anyway, we'll get to that later. You'd think it would be a spear because I'm always running spear units and all these runs. I just love the vanilla Damask Mace just because of how weird it is. Anyway, um... So, for upgrades early on, a lot of people, their first time through the game, miss anatomy. So there's this assumption that, you know, they're the AI is just getting, you know, getting all these extras and whatever else. Right off the bat, within your first couple fights, within your first couple skill upgrades, you pick up a weapon skill, you get that for free from the store. You pick that, uh, you pick up anatomy, and you pick up a warrior ring. That is already, uh, uh, that's already an extra 11 attack power added to your weapon which is basically about a 60% increase in overall penetration, just off a couple steps right there. Each of those things is then going to be going up over time, but right off the bat, you already have a major advantage. The AI doesn't even get that advantage up until uh, uh, around uh, early Chapter 2. So already, massive advantage. That alone, that little upgrade alone, is enough to carry you throughout the entirety of Chapter 1. 
by chapter two, by the time you've unlocked a finisher, there you go. Finishers alone, just the extra four from unlocking rank two, as well as, um, as well as uh, just kind of general understanding. Well, y you can use crafted stuff, to be fair. A crafted weapon here or there, completely just, it honestly will sort out any problem that you have. You can upgrade through crafting, you can upgrade through uh, uh, through those uh, those particular skill ranks. Honestly, if you max out at 3, that's fine. They go up to a maximum of 8, but at ranks 1 and 2, that is enough to carry you through the game. I've I proved years ago that you can get through the entire thing using no skills whatsoever. Right now in the background, I'm currently recording a video of getting through the entirety of the game and Coda at level 1, which means using exclusively level 1 gear and... Well, never getting any experience from a single fight just because, uh, you know, it honestly bugs me that that whole argument of class levels are the only thing that makes you strong is somehow still going like over a decade of people proving that wrong later. Anyway. Oh, yeah. And even after the one vision mod, of course, which completely you'd think would have thrown that out the window by now. So. You might be wondering why we're switching between classes, so for anyone who didn't know, every time you level up, you get a little base stat bonus. Uh, this is a 0.1 to 0.3 uh, uh, point increase to all of your stats across the board. They have a slight preference towards whatever that class was, but if we're being completely honest, you might as well just think of it as 0.1 across the board and think of anything else you get as, a, as just an extra. Um, because, yeah, it, it's a very marginal bonus, but every time you get a new class, you switch everybody to it, you go run one or two fights at Tynemouth Hill, you go to level 7, you go to level 10. Automatically, you have an extra stat point on everybody. Well, that was easy. You know, that took, like, what, a couple minutes? Sure, whatever, that's easy. So, as you can see, we're getting a few characters that are, you know, getting their stats up a little bit. Um, just so you know, when I went to the store, these weren't really picked specifically for their stats, but we have somebody with a dex that's almost at 40 right now. Um, anyway, uh, they're all going to be doing all kinds of things by the end of this anyhow, so my my point is, yeah, we've ranked up a couple classes, we've already gotten halfway to rank 2 crossbows, at which point we get our first TP scaling finisher. Um, so each of your finishers kind of has their kind of upsides and downsides benefit of tp scaling stuff if you it, like if you're looking for something to completely cheese out a fight with if you get a maxed out bar or you get tp plus once you get to 100 tp that is basically its base power every point after that can be seen as an extra point of damage so basically you get like let's say you get your tp upgraded all the way up to 300 suddenly you can you have an aoe that is going to be at baseline a minimum of like let's say in Brim brimstone's hails cases friggin like 200 damage per tile plus whatever base damage plus whatever damage you're uh, getting off of your augment bonus plus anything scaled up from there so again combining stuff it feels a little it feels a little odd sometimes but once you kind of mentally get that going you know it, it, it's it's cool how it all comes together by the way on the on the note of cross-classing Another uh, little bit of a misconception that comes up is that this game doesn't have cross-classing. Think about it for a second. You train somebody for a wizard, you train them for augment fire or whatever else, and then suddenly switch them over to a rogue with a crossbow, and suddenly they can use all of that training they got for augmenting fire to augment brimstone hail and stuff like that. Um, it's just little things like that that you can potentially get some really fun cheese out of. And just so you know, the accuracy scaling ones, that's not to say the damage scaling ones are always better. Actually, the strongest uh, hits in the game are from the accuracy scaling finishers. We'll get to more on that in a moment. Anywho, uh, so at this point I go and I pick up a bunch of scrolls because they're essentially free casting and I don't really want to spend the time to go set up all these wizards to uh, go learn all these spells or whatever else. I don't want to spend the slot for, uh, uh, for divine magic at this point, at least not yet. So I just had them spamming scrolls, as you do. Uh, there's not really any particular benefit. It's just, like, I can consistently do the same kind of attack on everybody without really bothering to set stuff up. But we keep going through these different classes. Uh, you can actually unlock Berserkers at Tynemouth Hill. Uh, that's another thing. Uh, they're a bit of a rare drop. Um, so actually getting an entire team change, I believe, only happened three times over the course of this entire 50-hour ludicrous endeavor. Anywho, 
So by this point, yeah, we switch over to knights. I finally decided to make use of those class marks. And as you can see, Denim has already has all of his class in, or, or what am I saying, all of his stats in the 40s. However, at the beginning of this whole thing, he was an avoidance specialist. As you see, despite going through all the classes, he is still an avoidance specialist. So the cool thing is that, yeah, they generally will still keep their same preferences. And you actually might have heard the whole stereotype. And I, I, I admit... I've kind of thrown this out there before as well. Yeah, you can power level this way to get all of your stats up to 100. For a little bit of context, there is a save file that I unfortunately lost uh, a few uh, devices ago um, that essentially was going through the entire game, min-maxing every class that came along the way for the entire party, and their stats still were not maxed out by the end of the game. Uh, yeah, there. I mean, you can go collect cards, you can do other things. Like, this is cheesable, but you have to realize it was really, really toned down in the English version that we got. If you want to see absolute insanity, that's when you go see the original Japanese version that didn't have, like, Coda in the post-game, and they just sort of didn't balance for all of that longer-term stuff. The skills were still slow as hell, but the crafting was a lot easier, um, and, the, um, and the base stats were just bonkers. <laughs> I mean, like, it was literally 10 times higher base stat growths in that one, and the results were just absolute jokes. Um, I may make a second video to this one just to show you how different of an experience that is, but, uh, yeah, that version is a trip if you uh, happen to have access to it. You can actually find UMDs of that pretty, chip, uh, pretty cheap if you happen to uh, need the legit version, but anyway. Neither here nor there. You know, knights get crossbows. Pretty much everybody gets crossbows. But this is this right here is the reason that I was dreading getting to level 10 with any classes. Because we wanted some stats and we wanted at least one functional finisher on somebody that isn't Canopus in order to make sure that we can actually do effective damage against Baldur armor. Because it is a fairly significant step up in armor and we wanted to specifically not be running wizards at that point because, well, you know. Well, it actually came to think that it's not, it's, ah, Baldur's not the anti-magic one. I'm thinking, okay. I'm getting a little bit confused here. No. Um, so when it comes to Baldur, it gives you an intelligence bonus. It's a good spell uh, spell casting armor. Um, in fact, running full Baldur and just using scrolls is absolutely a viable build if you want to go for like a tanky spell caster in this game. Um, but uh, but yeah, no. D just that boost in vitality and that boost in uh, uh, defense score definitely, uh, definitely makes a lot of things suddenly plink. It suddenly makes a lot of uh, beginner weapons absolute trash, which is why we wanted to be at least reasonably kitted out. But at this point, now that we can get past that, we can get Baldur armor of our own, as well as Brigandines, as well as Nomad Bracers. So Brigandines and Nomads are another thing that compiles onto that list of, you know, archers are unstoppable Giga Beasts because, like, they scale exclusively, well, not exclusively, everything has a different amount of scaling from uh, Dex and Strength. But, um, yeah, archers scale pretty darn well, and they get brigandine and nomads pretty early, which increase their decks by quite a crap load. And again, um, you know, longbows scale particularly well. So if they can't get past armor threshold, they do absolutely nothing, but if they, get, uh, if they do get past armor, they do a ton of damage. Now, in your main story mode playthrough... Honestly, that won't matter much. That's, again, the reason for that stereotype. Because after a certain point, there are not that many units that are running out, kitted out as full, proper tanks, uh, even in the Hanging Gardens. Uh, even your bosses and whatever else, they're, like, they may take a few extra shots, but realistically, they're not, like, giga tanks. When you get into the actual post-game, additional routes, all that kind of thing, you know, when the game actually starts trying... That's when stuff gets way more difficult for archers and where you see folks getting mad and yada yada. We, again, we've been down that road before. Right? Let's not rehash old stuff. So, skills that we're investing in at this point. I wanted to pick up spellcraft for everybody in order to make them, you know, better casters. Strengthen only boosts uh, only boosts your maximum uh, damage with a particular thing. So, if you're not getting past armor, it doesn't matter. Uh, spellcraft, on the other hand, actually helps you get past that armor, because wizards and melee characters work completely different. Or wizards and fighters, I should say. So, as we do, we're just running around, cycling through all those classes, attempting to avoid the next hurdle. So the next hurdle is going to be 23. 
Um, we want to get fully kitted out in uh, Balder. We want to ideally get Balder crossbows on people because that is the one that's been training the most because the crossbow is going to be the most universal weapon that each of the classes that we have has access to. Um, clerics have to deal with cudgels and uh, berserkers have to deal with hammers and such. Um, there's some crossover between them, but generally speaking, most of those classes have access to some form of crossbow. Um, we do get a siege bow, and I was using uh, Canopus with longbows up to this point, which is it's fine, whatever, they get longer range. Um, but bows, I mean, they I, I feel like they're far weaker than crossbows anyway, but that's, again, neither here nor there. Um, I started training spears on people just kind of for the hell of it, uh, started switching over to rune fencers. Um, at this point, I will admit I was getting kind of lazy with the whole thing, and I just, instead, uh, since we don't have access to AI yet, I just went to look through the cheats menu and found a uh, sort of forced AI cheat and just sort of let them auto-fight things for a while, so that whole 50 hours thing might not be entirely accurate. <laughs> just due, due to the fact that oftentimes I would just plug it in, walk away, and it's like, okay, I got some laundry to do or whatever else. I'm not going to sit here making the berserkers go whack all day. So, once again, as with every one of these videos, we found Tristan, we tracked him down, and we created a time paradox. So, March of the Black Queen, no longer canon. Um, anyway, so, lots of spears, lots of poking, lots of finishers, yada yada. Uh, so, to give you an idea, yeah, by this point... A slumber shot, so a damage scaling finisher at about 41% uh, higher than it normally would, uh, no, eh, 41 extra power than it would normally have. Still only doing 90 because we aren't getting past uh, armor as well as we should. At this point, we've hit that wall. So as you can see, once um, once they start coming out with proper uh, proper gear, we're having a much harder time getting past that armor. It would take multiple finishers just to finish this one random lizard. Um, Meanwhile, they're throwing out, uh, you know, multiple uh, uh, multiple hits like that. So, and as you can see, if we try to go in with basic weapons, as you'd expect, it's just planking off their armor, because I believe these guys are all running worm scale at this point. So, skills can help alleviate these situations, but only up to a certain extent. And the amount that it will matter is obviously always going to be different. But either way, at this point, we start winning those fights. Slowly but surely, these units in Tynemouth Hill are basic enough that we can start getting our own Wormscale Armor, Tridents, Damask Gear, all that kind of thing. Because, again, very basic uh, skills on these guys. Um, they're low-level versions, and I'll show you their actual skill loadouts in a moment here. Uh, their low-level versions will just have a weapon skill and nothing else. Their high-level versions will usually have a weapon skill, anatomy, and a specialist skill in some cases, but some of them are still, you know, just those basic originals. Now, to get to the Kajo question from earlier, if you ever wanted to be one of these people that wanted to grab a stick and make it go whack real good, then clerics are your best friend. See, if you want to uh, to uh, get a extremely busted unit that is just fun to play with because of how hilariously dumb it is, take a cleric, all right? Take multiple clerics, however many clerics you want. Teach them their basic healing abilities. Give them Sybil Staffs. Don't bother upgrading them. And uh, set their AI to melee, and uh, just uh, just go ahead and plug your PSP in, walk away, just let that Tine Mouth fight happen. You know what? Don't bother. That's all you got to do. They're going to heal themselves, they're going to take care of themselves. They're going to do no freaking damage, but they're going to get that cudgel skill up. Now, the fun part is, cudgel animations are faster than a lot of other weapons in the game. And additionally, because they have to take a whole lot of wax with them, uh, they tend to make their weapon skills go up drastically faster. In fact... The fastest weapon skills to actually level up comparatively, like, it, I'm sure I could break down an actual timetable over how long it takes, just how many time mouth takes it'll take to get to rank 2 or whatever, um, but take it from somebody that has freaking like, soloed different bits of this, uh, this game over and over in an attempt to try to permadeath it, cudgels are some of the fastest stuff to rank up and some of the most ludicrous damage you'll get while having some of the most oddly specific niche utility that you'll ever see. Again, more on that in a moment, but with just a couple of training fights, the clerics have already surpassed rank 2. They're well on their way to rank 3. <laughs> Meanwhile, bows, I believe, have just achieved rank 2, and pretty much everything else is at rank 1. So, there you go. Um, you know, put Fortify on if you're really feeling scared, but 
we just keep repeating this same cycle. If we go through each of the classes, we avoid the next wall, we get these uh, these new pieces of gear, upgrade everybody's stuff little by little. As long as we have the damage threshold to withstand what's coming in, and as long as we have some sort of means to keep whacking until we eventually break their armor, you know, good stuff's going to happen. So by the time we do reach that level 23 wall, uh, he's almost at rank 5 cudgels. Um, so that's fun, you know. It was just fun checking in and seeing, uh, seeing all this happen. As you can see, we're hitting uh, 84 plus 84 on raining blows for this guy. Don't worry, it'll get a lot better than that. It it doesn't max out there. Um, so, fun part about this is I was also leaving the female clerics with the Caldias so that they can run around charming things to somewhat speed up the uh, the process here. Um, just made the lizards go and fight each other. Sometimes it helped, sometimes it didn't. Didn't matter. We started getting Damask here. Um, Really, the focus is less on out DPSing everybody and more just being able to survive their damage long enough to just choke the crap out of everything on the map. So, we switch back to wizards for a little bit, for a little bit of a uh, wizarding action. They make big boom go happen, they get more gear, you get the drill, you, we use some books for reasons. I forget why I was using books exactly, but I don't really care. Um, as you can see, enemy archers, though, still doing over 100 damage. Melee characters at this point are doing around 120. Generally speaking, that is pretty accurate. Um, because, yeah, melee weapons in general, despite, again, you will see this in a moment, despite the stereotype, the melee weapons do actually have better stats and damage overall, generally, um, and against more types of enemies. Uh, ranged weapons just definitely have better scaling, so... You find a way to get them past armor, like for example, theoretically, and this is actually one of the things you'll see come up uh, for the level 1 run, you can lower damage threshold very significantly by having a Terra Knight scare somebody. It is a locked percentage um, that can work against any enemy. Um, and cool thing is that uh, that it causes, uh, again, causes that threshold to drop, which means that suddenly a lower attack value or higher scaling weapon can do a hell of a lot more. So yes their their damage go crazy as you do now at this point we started recruiting because i was getting to the higher end of things and i finally felt comfortable enough uh, to have everybody you know go around just spamming recruit on everybody for whatever odds they could get um i wasn't trying to go back and redo recruits under different circumstances yeah you can cheese that if you really want to but i just started recruiting people at random and just collecting whatever gear they had now, the cool thing is, uh, once you surpass level 23 and you get those level 26 enemies, that's when they start uh, carrying rings on them, which means that, yes, you can get a full complement of all the stat rings, whatever stat rings you want. Um, so, there you go. That, that's all nice and fancy. At this point, we have archers that are able to one-shot people. Fantastic. Well, clerics anyway, but it's something. We'll take it. Um, they're still not doing a whole lot of damage against the lizards, uh, but hey, it's better than it was before. You know, we're working our way up there. But this is just kind of to point out that everybody's got maybe 10 stat points higher than the game would have really expected them to have at this point. But again, it's that armor. It's the armor and the penetration that ends up still keeping stuff sane. If that wasn't there, if this was an FFT or whatever else, yeah, they'd be completely wiping the floor with everybody. And it's not to say that they don't have an advantage. They have a clear and obvious advantage, but there's you can still feel a threat from those enemy units. Alright, so, more gear, more upgrades, more going. We're 84 battles in at this point. Uh, we literally spent uh, 1,100 days walking back and forth. I mean, when Canopus said train, we took that to heart pretty seriously. But, um, and this actually came up in a comment yesterday, um, the, the, uh, the whole idea of, uh, of why can't I recruit Cressida. Probably you grinded too much. So... I know this seems like a weird point to bring up while we're still at Tynemouth Hill, but if you've ever been unable to recruit Cressida, generally speaking, as long as you haven't gone out of your way to give the middle finger to Galgastan at every possible opportunity, you're usually going to be pretty darn close or above the point that you need in order to be able to, uh, to actually recruit her. Um, but to give you an idea of the breakdown, um, if you remember the intro to the game, they're basically pointing out, hey, the majority of people are Galgastani. Um, that's not to say their government is particularly nice, but, you know, uh, we're not even going to try to reference real-world events right now. But you get the general idea. Um, they got a lot of, uh, they got a lot of dudes. If you're going around shankifying all their dudes, they're not going to be terribly happy with you. Now, 
It does go down drastically faster if you have, say, Galgastani fighting Galgastani, but still, if you're going around, you know, running small scale genocides every week, then yeah, you're gonna have, uh, you're gonna have a bit of a bad reputation there. So if you don't grind, or at least keep it minimal, and you have choices that are generally leaning towards either neutral or towards Galgastan there, um, you really w shouldn't have much of an issue uh, recruiting uh, uh, Cressida there. It, it just cracks me up because I feel like I have to mention it every time I see uh, Mr. Foles uh, uh, having a little mini heart attack over at the Discord. <laughs> so why are people still assuming this? <laughs> anyway, moving on. So, at this point, yeah, you know, we're, we're able to start two-shotting archers. This is alright. We're starting to get past worm scale. This is, uh, this is a good time. Now, when it comes to enemies, they're not all made equal. Some of them come in with brigandines, or some of them some of them will come in with balder. Yeah, their armor is going to be a lot worse than the ones that show up with worm scale. Um, uh, we start getting our first elemental bow options, which means that we can additionally start training more skills at once. Yeah, sure, they split the experience, but whatever. Um, but that means an additional plus four penetration because reasons. Um, yeah, so. Hundreds, hundreds, hundred fifties on the shots. We can finally get down to three shotting lizards. All right, best weapon that we could possibly get a hold of so far. It's three shotting. It feels a, you know, definitely feels like uh, that's maybe not the super giga weapon that it was made out to be. But all right, whatever. You know, it's it's still good. It's still good. Uh, so we keep recruiting, we keep doing this thing, we keep finding tanky units like this. See, like, this guy doesn't even have many skills on him, but still, just the fact that he's got uh, two uh, two worm scale items and a nice shield, he's got a he's got a ring, you know, this dude's pretty tanky. This guy can take some pretty solid punishment. He can resist arrows. Now, I want you to look at this, because this is the moment right here. Where you, where you usually tend to see the comments come out of the word works like, yeah, see, this is what I said. You, you only do bows because they're overpowered, which, I mean, they're strong, but I still would argue after everything, they're working as intended. I mean, hell, they even said in interviews they're working as intended. Because, okay, 372, that's great. Now, this is on a squishy unit, on a maxed out TP bar, on a damage scaling move, on a guy that has been scaled exclusively for bonus damage. This is his max, basically. Uh, we can add a breach and strength into this. I'm sure we could get this to about a 500. That's adorable. Moving on. So, you know, we give him some rings. We get more recruits. I drop one of the screwdrivers I was playing with. Screw it. No pun intended. Um, recruit more people, recruit more people, recruit more people. Now, okay. So, you know, bows are pretty good. Uh, Canopus is getting, I believe, either close to maxed out or is maxed out at this point. So that's pretty strong, right? I mean, we, we got our main guy doing 240 over here. Alright. Do a couple more upgrades. Uh, I wonder how high that cudgel could go. Hmm. Alright, well, I mean, I, look at this, though. As to, to give you an idea of why the AI archers always seem so much stronger than everybody else... Look at the gear they're coming in with and the skills they're coming in with. Okay, so this is their basic high-level flavor type situation. Archer comes in, rank 4 bows, plus up to rank 5 due to the bow itself, plus tremendous shot, plus they have anatomy. So they're getting essentially 50% uh, bonus ranks on their stuff, just off what they have here. Now let's compare it with the Berserker that they came with, with rank 1 axes and nothing else. <laughs> I mean, like, sure, he's at a higher level, but come on now. Those levels are not going to matter much. Like, those four levels, by this point, do not matter. Like, okay, the, the whole thing on class levels, okay? Think of it in three piles. Like, you've got your gear, you've got your character's actual stats, those base stats, and then you've got your class stats. So, every time they level up, those base stats go up, um, eventually maxing out to a point where your base stats and class stats will basically even out towards the end. Now... Think percentage-wise, like, they've gone up a level, their stats have gone up a tiny bit in the background. They get maybe one or two stat points, whatever else, depending on what it is, per level up, right? Each of those stat points doesn't always even translate to one extra damage. Meanwhile, you get some of these skills that will transfer to four. You equip a different piece of equipment, you get another four. Or, for example, towards the end game, you start stuff, uh, seeing stuff adding multiple skills at once, 
So, you know, sure, parry on its own, it might have might, might not have uh, leveled up uh, particularly well. You pick up a Rezenzi shield, though, suddenly, oh yeah, look at that, 10% more likely to parry because of those two extra ranks on it. Um, so stuff starts to get interesting as far as that goes, but anyway, all of this starts to add up more and more as to the kind of stereotypes of this game. Our little lizard man nation is coming along pretty well here. I guess uh, it's less uh, mother base, more like mother nest over here. Um, start getting uh, our first elemental crossbow. I believe this. there's only two that you can pick up in Tynemouth Hill. Actually, I thought it maxed out at the uh, rude bow for the longest time because the other one was pretty rare. Um, anyway, uh, also if you didn't know, if you put three pieces of dragon gear, like anything with dragon in the name on somebody... Um, and this applies to Dragon Claw, Dragon Axe, uh, just a Dragon Shield, um, plus the Dragon Armor. Uh, you get Dragon Slayer on somebody, so you do, n despite, again, another one of the stereotypes of you need Dragoons on certain maps, how dare they? And it's like, you know, you could just, early early in the game, you use Spellcasters as your backup plan. Later on in the game, you, I mean, you have Worm Scale as a standard thing. You can put that on pretty much any melee class. Or even ranged class. Um... Like, there's nothing stopping you from just putting for full uh, ranged gear on, hell, let's say a warrior with a short bow, and suddenly they will do some pretty primo damage with that. Um, especially, like, a light crossbow, and then you put a uh, dragon slayer, and uh, then you can essentially use dragon slayer to build up the TP to instantly get a death whale. And these kinds of crazy combinations are why I love this game. Moving on. Uh, so, we start seeing the elemental wands show up. They may make big damage happen. Uh, you've got stuff, you know, Brimstone Hail doing the big old booms as it does. It doesn't really hold up nearly as well once you start getting towards end game content because, again, you start blowing through those early game enemies, but you get to the later game stuff and it's like, well, it did 90 to a group. Sucks they had 500 health, but okay. Uh, we get our first Colnacrone. Always fun to say. We get our first Holy Crown, which is definitely not a unique item in this one. In fact, actually, that's one of the few gripes I actually do still kind of wonder about with the remake, because the Holy Crown is not really a good enough item to make it non-unique. So I wonder if this was just an oversight, because... So, if you didn't know, in the very original, there was only one Holy Crown. You only got it if Kashro survived the story, and it was basically a reference back to March of the Black Queen, where if you found a Dream Crown and you gave it to an Amazon, then they, uh, they became a princess. So basically the idea was, you know, she got promoted to her class, so she got a crown. So, anyway... Um, moving along, we start getting Dragon Hammers. Not as good as the Glory Hammer, but whatever. Um, moving on, get more stuff, get more gear. This is basically the best archer setup in my book. Yes, it's a light crossbow. That I mean, look, longbows are all well and good. I don't like when something is so oddly specific that it's like, oh, it has a great max hit, and then it does one against that thing over there. I hate that. Because that's when you see those, you know, see those arguments of, like, it's broken because it doesn't work against this thing. It's like, no, it's it's a thing exclusively on scaling, and that thing just negative scaled your damage. Maybe you should have just brought something else. Um, and that's what I like about crossbows in this one, that they similarly have a problem where, you know, they, okay, they go for higher, uh, higher penetration but lower scaling, um, and especially the light versions, but they can still make use of the same finishers, and... Anything that is accuracy scaling has a basic uh, base attack added to it, which means that it will be universally good against something. And something like Death Whale, once you eventually max it out, is basically a one-shot kill against anything. Moving on. Um, yeah, so maces, or rather hammers, uh, by this point, doing 340s. Uh, base stats have gotten to the point now where levels are more of a suggestion in the background, but... Uh, you know, the 340 is pretty, pretty solid for a finisher. Um, you know, throwing rocks are already doing 34 because these guys don't have the vitality to resist it. Uh, daggers are doing 154, which, again, daggers are interesting. Because I used to think that, again, they were just permanently broken because early on they're very strong. Mid-game they're very strong. They don't get past that point, though. So, um, it's like once you get towards the, the higher end of things... Like, this is more or less where they cap out. They have a very comparatively low maximum, but they hit it much earlier, is the best way to put it. Um, so they can one-shot stuff and all that, but this was the first instance of the Damask Mace entering the party, and I was happy. 
because this stupid humble weapon is my favorite dang thing in the uh, favorite weapon in this game. Terrible actual attack value. Decent strength bonus, decent dex bonus, 5% an uh, anti people uh, damage, 7% extra crush damage that you can never have the penetration to use, and a little bit of extra health with a quirky little plus one anatomy in the background. We'll get to why that matters in a moment, but let's just say it's an interestingly defensive weapon. So, you know, we do 50s with it. It's not super great, especially against squishy units because it doesn't scale very well, but it's uh, it's workable. You know, it, it's generally going to be weak against a whole lot of things. It's still doing ones to lizards, uh, despite all of our gains up to this point. But, you know, as time goes on, we find out some of our characters with uh, better strength Doing, uh, doing 35 with it. Okay, it's technically damaging the double digits. We're fine. So, we start firing people because we have a full team. And this is uh, this is when I was reminded that the Keening Bowgun is actually a thing that you can uh, get for free in Time Mouth Hill. So, I actually saw a guy, uh, actually I think that was Mr. Foles, uh, trying to grind out a Keening Bowgun in Palace of the Dead to complete a collection log for this game. It's like, yeah, you can just go to Time Mouth Hill apparently. Totally forgot this was a thing, but there you go. Um, anywho, so we have that guy. We do more of this thing. We get our first Rosenzi, as you do. Uh, we ha Okay, so th in this case, I was just comparing what this mace can do. Uh, or apparently it was... Oh, no, no, no. This was a crit with a throwing rock. That's what I was looking to confirm. I think... So I think you can get a crit if you have a higher level than your enemy. I think if you have lower, you may not be able to. I don't have any con confirmation on that rule, but I think it might be true. Anyway, so moving on, we see Raining Blows is now doing 340s. Okay, so it's matching hammers. That's interesting. Um, you know, again, still a fairly humble weapon, but whatever. Uh, we start getting rank 4 skills on people. Uh, we get 19 uh, out, of, uh, out of some guy. We get a Thunderbow. Again, lots of nice little dandy things. As you can see, despite everything, our leader is still getting knocked out by very basic enemies. So by no means have they become gods yet. And I think it's time for a sip of some coffee. I actually meant to uh, show off the uh, the fact that there's charm spells in the store much earlier. Uh, there's quite a lot of different uh, spells. In fact, um, actually one of the funnier things is that uh, you can... You can do a lot of interesting stuff with the uh, the spell books uh, in the vanilla game, and it's actually like as much as it's a weird mechanic, I kind of like it for the same reason that I like it in Morrowind, where you have characters that are completely not specialized in something that can just spend money to be able to do that same thing as another class. So, for example, you have archers that are able to uh, to go put paralysis or poison or whatever else on their arrows, even though that's not a skill that the class actually has. So, it's you know, it's just a fun little thing you can do. Um, granted, this eventually was actually added in one vision by giving them uh, 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 Art of War, so there's that. Anyway, so we're, you know, we're still doing consistently above 300 with this cudgel now, so that's nice, whatever. Um, and you might still wonder why would anybody like the cudgel? Why, like, specifically, why the Damask Mace? So, first of all, here's the Damask Mace doing 620, and allow me to explain why. See, because... Like the other things, it also can scale particularly well. But it also has a weird benefit of being an oddly defensive weapon. So it has a weird spread of different abilities. It has a an odd kind of setup for its uh, for its actual weapon type because not many things use cudgels. But basic warrior plus cudgel, like I said, is pretty much my favorite kind of setup in this game. Reason being. Uh, is uh, weapon resists. So when you have two different weapon skills, they counteract each other. Um, additionally, uh, when it comes to something like anatomy, that can be counteracted as well. But what this creates is this kind of weird tipping point effect where nothing has cudgels, so almost nothing resists cudgels. Um, and additionally, because it can actually go over the anatomy bonus, you'll consistently usually be a higher anatomy level than anybody that's around you, meaning that you will still be getting a bonus off that skill instead of having it nullified, which effectively means that in a lot of cases, when you start scaling stuff up, uh, you know, stuff like raining blows can start doing absolutely ludicrous damage pretty quickly. Uh, it unlocks at rank four, by the way, if you're, if you're wondering. 
for cudgels especially they they rank up so dang quick that it really does not take that long um i'm not saying to sit there and grind i mean really one of the main points i was trying to make hilariously by the way if he attacks one of his own people their vitality is high enough that it does three um really one of the main points i was trying to make out of all of this is that the, you can get a lot more done with simple tweaks than grinding. Like, all of this grinding is all well and good, but many of the big power jumps, as you might have been able to tell throughout this uh, video, have strictly been from little, uh, you know, one-time bonuses, just putting a rank 1 skill on somebody. You know how we started doing damage to lizards? It wasn't getting new finishers or whatever else. Sure, that helped. Um, it wasn't uh, getting higher stats. Sure, that eventually helped. It was getting Herpetology, just rank 1 Herpetology. Everyone, as far as I'm aware, still has rank 1 or 2 Herpetology. And that was enough to essentially be the tipping point effect at certain times. Anyway, um, so, you know, this just kind of continues on and on and on. I started going through all the different classes, uh, started picking up the different weapons. So let's go back to the actual uh, file here, uh, kind of show what, uh, what we're working with here. So I didn't end up completely maxing everybody because, honestly, I started getting a little burnt out with it because I just wanted to finally make this video and move back on to the level 1 run. Especially because I'm really excited over uh, uh, over properly getting it done with uh, proper PSP hardware. I don't know, I'm getting weirdly excited over old-timey adapters at this point. So much so that, actually, th the other day I ended up being extraordinarily sleep-deprived <laughs> and, uh, and ended up waking up, but... You know, I had to go get my wife's stuff ready for uh, for her work and everything, and I was like, uh, how exactly do I convince myself to wake up? And I just had this bizarre hallucination of just trying to work together, like, 50 different adapters of different kinds, and I was the weirdest freaking thing. Anyway, moving on to what I was trying to show here. Um, so, looking at the skills, yeah, not... It's going to be rank 1 or 2 Herpetology on everybody. Uh, by the way, I apologize for kind of going in and out of menus here, um, because I will... Uh, essentially, I, I haven't exactly uh, set up L and R buttons on this one for some dumb reason. But, you know, Aug's generally going to be rank 1 or 2 on everybody still. You know, Herpetology, whatever. Uh, some augments are higher than others. Generally speaking, cudgels are higher than every on everybody because you just make somebody a cleric and have them go whack for a lunch break, and you'll suddenly have a very uh, uh, reliable uh, weapon thing. Uh, cool thing is all of the uh, uh, all the maces and gear and whatever and kind of stuff in the cudgel category actually does have viable options throughout the game. It just kind of depends how you go. So if, like if you're going for smacky warrior dude. Uh, let's, Let's uh, just go over the cudgels real quick. Because, like, yeah, you just start off with basic stick. This is probably the most uh, f functional training weapon in the game. If you want to train parry or deflect or whatever else, literally just give somebody a Sybil Staff, make them a healer, and just have them sit there just blocking or deflecting arrows over and over. I mean, you just leave them on AI, and they'll just sit there, you know, dealing with attacks as they come. It's not, uh, you know, perfectly efficient, but you just leave it running, and who cares? Um... You know, stuff like mage, mage Staff's better for casters. You got, uh... You just generally got different upgrady sticks. Like, you, you got your status guy, you got this one. You got your damage guy, you got this one. You know, your big wacky hammer thing, you got this one. And what is that cat doing now? Alright, whatever. Random... Random cat showing on some cardboard. Why not? So, um... So, yeah, like the Damask Mace here. If I... Managed to hit the right button here. An anatomy plus one doesn't seem like much, but constantly having that advantage of being able to make use of anatomy skill while the other guy can't is a lot more decisive than it seems. Um, just general kind of de uh, damage uh, bonuses off of its stats and stuff like that. Sure, it sucks that it's two-handed, but it's just... I don't know, I appreciate the weirdness of it, <laughs> is the thing, you know? And I, I wonder if anybody else has that same thing, but... Past that point, you start getting even better upgrades, like uh, you got your uh, Restoration Staffs, which are almost as much uh, damage as the Mace, um, but it goes one-handed, it gets a Vitality bonus, it uh, gets all those casting bonuses, plus it happens to be a healing weapon. Then stuff st just starts going absolutely wacky with these ones. Like, if you've been training Augments up to this point, uh, these can be absolutely crazy. Like, uh, technically, Staff of Restoration has higher penetration than the Damask Mace. Uh, if... Um, 
if uh, you have uh, light aug uh, which realistically if you have a cleric doing that it's actually one of the things where i i was i was kind of testing out the viability of a cleric only run a while ago and sure it's totally doable uh, it ain't the fastest thing in the world but if somebody wants to see it by all means let me know um and so yeah you got uh you know you got all your elemental ones and they're suddenly getting pretty much into proper end game weapon damage i mean cudgels it can actually be a pretty solid skill but let's go over the other stuff that we ended up finding uh, a while out here. Bear in mind, I didn't get all the drops. I didn't. I didn't get all the recruits. Whatever else. This is just kind of like a general sampler platter of what we got. So maxed out at Hellhound Claws. I believe that's the best that you can encounter there. Dragon Claws are arguably probably going to be more useful because you can put Dragon Slayer on somebody. I mean, Claws in general are just not amazing in this game. But if you have somebody running Claws, screw it. Whatever. There you go. Um, knives, um, I didn't actually get the best one, which is the Marauder Knife, uh, though Valiant Dagger, when you can upgrade it later, is arguably a bit more useful. Plus, you know, daggers plus one is a pretty solid thing. Um, again, same thing as with Anatomy, that plus one, just to be able to outskill the other guy, is pretty handy. Um, though that said, more stuff will be running Valiant Dagger, so it's not necessarily as big of a bonus, you're just kind of counteracting the other guy's bonus. Um... That's whatever. Um, Kukri seemed to be the best sword that was available. Uh, ice swords are your main uh, uh, are going to be your main uh, elemental option. Uh, Kukri plus one turns into a fire one, but again, we don't have access to crafting yet. Uh, dragon axes and uh, balbergans are going to be your best for axes. Dragon axes would probably be the best for that dragon slayer effect earlier. They're going to be doing a little bit better. Uh, spear wise, we wind up getting pretty much the full complement. I personally like the, uh, the upgraded scorpions because of that poison effect. Uh, you can do some cheese with that. Uh, if you have a low level unit that can use spears, I mean, just give them a scorpion plus one. Even if they can't do much else useful, they can run around trying to poison stuff with a guaranteed poison effect, you know? Um, or not guaranteed, but it's like a secondary roll. Um, but then, uh, yeah, Colmicrones are pretty solid for, uh, rune fencers, especially, again, if you're region locked here. Uh, since they're probably going to be running Divines anyway, so that's all nice and dandy. Uh, hammers get a pretty solid uh, uh, solid supply here, uh, showing up with multiple Yggdrasil Gnarls. Again, Dragon Hammer, solid for that uh, Dragon Slayer effect. I believe you can just do Hammer, Shield, and Armor if you want to equip another thing in the other slot. So that's always nice too. Um, cudgels we already went over, this stuff we already went over. And uh, then, yeah, let's uh, let's see. Uh, so ranged weapons, we do, 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 do. Uh, we did get, uh, where were they? Apparently in the next tab. So we got three types of elemental bows that are available. Uh, basic Thunder, Tempest, and uh, Permafrost. Um, I would say Ixcamilles generally is probably the most useful for a single player playthrough, but you got the other ones as other scaling options, and especially multiplayer options as time goes on. They get better attack values. It's just, yeah, the ability to shackle on shot, like, especially shackle on tremendous shot, is pretty darn nifty. Um, uh, rude bow and uh, keening bow guns, way more common than I ever recall them being when I was actually looking for them, so that's nice. Uh, no thrown weapons, no two-handed uh, swords, no two-handed katanas, no one-handed katanas, no whips, um, and no instruments, obviously, because there are no instruments pretty much anywhere. Um... All right, next up, let's look what we got shield-wise, uh, which we got a pretty solid selection of basically everything. Um, I'm pretty sure most know by this point, but yeah, it, all these things where it says that something resists something, all of their uh, pair, uh, all of their upgraded versions will replace these resists with a uh, uh, with a proof. So you know, uh, silence proof, which this kind of drops off over time. But either way, uh, stun proof, really solid as a frontliner shield, uh, sleep proof, uh, pretty good as well. Uh, charm proof, definitely handy for some of your uh, damage dealers. Poison proof, less of a thing. Boulder shield kind of takes over for a lot of things, especially since uh, when it comes to the buckler, uh, they end up missing out later on uh, because the, uh, the buckler uh, ends up getting its proof replaced by the wizard hat. There's really no point in having two of those. Even the basic version has silence proof. Um, additionally, uh, shield-wise, we have, you know, the standard endgame store stuff. You get heaters. I, I don't remember if you can actually get... I think you can get Damascus shields at the store. Um, and then you get dragon scales and resinzies, which, yeah, resinzies, without any anything. They just come in with parry plus two, so... 
don't even worry. Like, if you have somebody that's a parry specialist, just give them a Rezenzi. These things just drop randomly. Like, you don't need to do anything special to get them. Um, so, so yeah. Like, I don't believe... I think there was only one recruit guy that actually dropped, that dropped this. The other one was just a random drop. So you have that as an option. And then, armor-wise, we got multiple Holy Crowns. Again... No reason to go grinding out Palace of the Dead when you can just find these suckers in frickin' Tide Mouth. Uh, Damask Helms out the ears, wizard hats for days. Uh, all the endgame armor <laughs> you could want. Uh, do we have enough worm scale armor for the entire frickin' team at this point? Almost. But, you know, we've got Brigandines and Damasks and all that kind of business. Um, and yeah, as, as much as I like to say that the AI doesn't get access to good armor... The thing is, if we look at all the worm scale pieces, and especially, or uh, sorry, at uh, like the Damask worm scale set, that a lot of them run, um, you'll notice very high vitality scores. So defense is decent, vitality is decent. I actually forgot to mention this earlier when it came to the shields. They're kind of interchangeable. They'll upgrade their stats a little bit, but when it comes to shields, ignore the blue numbers. Go for the uh, bonus effects on them, um, because yeah, they it's just good. Like, the, most of their actual defense scores are very comparable. They've all got different roles. Um, but, uh, but yeah, when it comes to the armor, generally speaking, the armor that uh, shows up around endgame, it's either going to be specialized in offense, like the Brigandine, where it's going all for dex and avoidance, or uh, going for strength and agility and resistance uh, for the Damask, or you've got the heavy version, which is going specifically for mind and vitality. Uh, in this case, it's just going strength and vitality, so that's a lot of physical bulk uh, or some resistance on the Damask here. Like, generally speaking, it it definitely doesn't downscale armor like as well as the elemental vests or something like that. So part of the reason that you see a lot of stuff, uh, like when you get into multiplayer, I, I want to point out for some reason, somebody demanded that this game needed a multiplayer function and that the units needed to apparently be balanced against each other. I mention this specifically because when it comes to the endgame armor, uh, it is very general purpose, and that's kind of understandable for its kind of mass use all across the game. Because, yes, high vitality resists absolutely everything, so that is a solid choice. But the stuff that is quote-unquote considered busted that the player can have access to is going to be stuff that gets past basic armor and scales, uh, just basically scales like crazy. And the thing is that, yeah, eventually skills with any weapon will get high enough to the point where they will be able to get past defense threshold. And at that point, it becomes about downscaling that armor. So at that point, that's when fortify units end up being able to resist stuff a lot better, or resistance units ends up, end up uh, being able to resist a lot better. Or you see units with, uh, like, for example, uh, uh, weapon necklaces, or sorry, not uh, weapon necklaces, the, uh, the weapon earrings that suddenly seem a lot more resistant to a lot of damage, it's not because of stat buffs. It's because those things innately have, like, I think it's, like, 15, 20, whatever percent resistance to bonus damage. Um, so, basically, the higher end just becomes about downscaling that kind of, uh, kind of stuff. So, for example, like, Holy Crown right here, bizarrely, gives you 10% uh, bonus uh, damage resistance against Divine Things, which kind of whatever. Um, when it comes to these armors, you get a lot of uh, damage resistance against dragons for worm scale, uh, but the sorcerer's robes are able to resist 5% of all elemental stuff. This isn't just from casters, it means that they can also survive finishers a lot better. Um, but the upgraded versions that the player has access to is it, are able to uh, do this stuff a lot better. Like, 2% uh, bonus damage resistance for the Mage Mitts doesn't seem like much, but they also have a Vitality bonus, so it's actually a little bit better than I would have thought. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, you really don't get too many of these bonus damage type resistances. And in fact, that's the funny thing, because one of the early craftable items, your Bronze Helm, has bonus damage resistance against everything in the game, and when you upgrade it, it, uh, it ends up uh, boosting that up to 10... Uh, 10%, so it's a surprisingly good endgame helmet, um, all things considered. But, uh, but yeah, just kind of something to consider. Uh, all of these rings, for example, give you another 5, so that's kind of whatever, but that's what you have access to here. So, 
basically, yes. Uh, let's look over ranks next. Uh, so yeah, most weapon skills pretty low. Cudgel is pretty high. Crossbow is slightly higher. Um, everything else, again, pretty low freaking ranks. As you'd expect, it was using Recruit a whole bunch, but it didn't level up, which kind of confuses me a little bit, not going to lie, because I had a unit um, a few runs ago um, that, uh, that was just... Uh, what the hell was their name? Okay, so I had a knight named Philip, and I made it a point that every time that they found another unit named Philip, they had to go out of their way to recruit them. Now, you can actually boost a recruit very easily. Um, so if you didn't know... If you have that unit doing nothing better, you know how the Recruit has crazy range? You can just keep using Recruit at long range, and they'll essentially just talk to themselves and keep training the skill. Um, and so, that guy wound up with, like, rank 3 Recruit by the end of Chapter 4 somehow, so I'm sure there's some other way to power level it that I'm not realizing here. Uh, because actually, a successful Recruit doesn't really seem to work any better than a failed one, so... I don't know. I'm sure there's something more to it, just like everything with this game. But uh, that's kind of the end of this little uh, little experiment here. I ended up getting, you know, most of these classes a decent bit of the way up. Um, uh, base stat-wise, towards the very end here, I mean, we're not even talking double starting stats at this point. This is pretty standard endgame type stuff. So you can power level this way. And generally speaking, 1 to 10, ridiculously easy. That's like one or two fights. 20 to 30 is... Usually going to be, uh, again, one or two, occasionally more. Um, but if we... Hang on, where was it? Uh, if we go over to... Well, I don't remember where the thing is. Oh, yeah, there, at the very bottom. So you can see uh, around level 20s, you get uh, 961 from completing a Tyne Mouth Hill run. Um, more if you recruit somebody of that same class, so potentially another power leveling thing for you if that's really what you want to do. Um, but, uh, but yeah, generally, even getting up to about 30, you can still potentially do uh, one per, uh, you know, one level per one fight. They're very quick fights. Um, and then you start getting into, uh, the, you know, the high 40s, it ends up uh, potentially going two or three. It really isn't worth it by that point, just do like up to 13 or so is usually what I usually go for. Just get a new class, put it up to 13 or so. There you go. You get some new stats, move on, find something better to do. Um, and then if you need a, you know, a power boost of some kind, just rearrange skills. Find something that ranks up, something that boosts attack. Just shift stuff around. Maybe just terrify something to lower its damage threshold. Um, and... Also, if you're curious, uh, where is thing? Warren Report is here. So, officially, this was 50 hours, and I put in a little cheat to give you an idea of Chaos Frame. Even with completely annihilating Galgastani here, um, our Chaos Frame of the Galgastani is still 46. You do lose some uh, with the story, and so you gotta regain it back through good choices, but just for a little bit of context there, this is kind of what we're working with. Um, and I believe 247 is how many fights I had in one of the save files that made it all the way through the end of CODA, so there's really no reason to do it this way. But if you were ever curious what the results would be, there you go. I just saved you 50 hours. <laughs> so you guys have a good one. Let me know if you have any other questions about this, because this was a, a weird, friggin' just offbeat experiment. And again, a lot of it was just to kind of show the kinds of systems that are in place in order to hopefully explain some of the weird crap that you'll be seeing in the uh, level 1 run without repeatedly saying the same stuff over and over. I mean, that run technically started years ago, and then I never finished it, so I'm essentially taking the footage from that one, and I'm completing the run, and then mashing it all together, and then attempting to not suck at editing. So we'll see how all this plays out. Um, my expectations aren't terribly high for it, so, you know, temper those as you will, but I'm hoping... I'm hoping it'll turn out looking at least reasonably nice. But, you know... We'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. And uh, last little note for a uh, little starting area. I always love pointing this out. If you never knew, um, yeah, someone else actually does plan what your main characters plan to do in the background, and it doesn't go so well for them. Anyway, that's about that. You guys have a good one. Take care. Thank you all for, uh, for watching and everything else. And, uh, yeah, have a great one. Bye.